you all. Test, test. Can you hear me? No, I know you all. You all can hear me. Live stream people. David, can you hear me? Oh, excellent. All right, excellent. Well, thank you all so much to come, for coming to our first Back Together in person in the IC Fish and Friends. We're so glad you're here. I see new and familiar faces. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate you. Welcome back to Reef. We're glad you're here. Um, we have a, So we'll start off all of our Fish and Friends with a few community announcements before we get into our program for the evening. Um, upcoming at Reef, we've got our Garden Club uh, this Sunday, 10 a.m. at the campus. If you want to try out your green thumb, Lori Brooks is going to lead us through that, which will be wonderful. She knows all of the floor plants, um, and she helps maintain those here at our campus, which is great. We also have our Earth Day Lionfish Derby um, on Sunday, April 24th. So definitely meet us at Sharky's, enter a team. Um, Rainbow Reef is going to be taking out some charters if you're interested in going, um, to, or you can take your own boat, however you want to get involved. Um, we would love to see you there. We'll have tastings, we'll have vendors, we'll have all sorts of fun stuff, educational dissections. Um, come learn about the invasive lionfish and have some fun. We also have our Fish Out of Water 5K um, running from the week of June 6th through June 12th. And you can do that however you want, whether it's scuba diving, walking, running, <laughs> kayaking. I will be walking it. That is, I will be walking it. I will not be running it. Biking. Um, so sign up through for that online. Yes, Moose. I would like to say that the, um, it is virtual, so you can do it anytime you want. Yeah, if you yeah. do it on your couch, walking back and forth through your seat. Uh, <laughs> but um, all the registration money goes to the Oceans for All Fund, which helps us provide more inclusive programming for groups that couldn't afford it normally, and helps us fund our internship program as well. Too. So, even if you don't want to actually do the 5K and you just want a cool shirt and say you are supporting um, underserved groups and interns, you should sign up for the 5K. And you can join a cool fish team as well, too. Get some fun All right. Nice. For our live stream folks, Moose was saying that the virtual 5K sends all of our fun or provides all of its funds to the uh, Oceans for All Fund, which is a fund that. Uh, supports all of our education programs here at Reef, as well as the Marine Conservation Internship Program. So even if you just want a cool shirt, definitely sign up. You can choose a fun fish team. I'm Team Lionfish, which is, you know. All right. So, Conservation Challenge. I'm not the right person to talk about. <laughs> Sarah's next door, I forgot. I will talk about it. Um, the Conservation Challenge is running at uh, Reef right now and you can join online and it's a goal. The goal is to collect as many stickers as possible. Um, and you get a sticker for every region you do a survey in, every activity you participate in with Reef, whether that's a 5K, whether that's the Derby, whether that's an education program, all sorts of cool stuff. You get also get, you get one just for signing up, which is even better. Um, that's the one I have and one for doing a survey. So go, Dave. Um, but you all can do that too. So you should get as many surveys as you can. Um, as well as do as many activities as you can. Everything from our book club online to participating in the 5K um, to showing up to one of the events here at the campus. Does anyone have any community announcements they would like to make? Anything coming up here in Key Largo? Lovely. All right. And with that, I'd like to introduce Jess Keller. She's from Fish and Wildlife, and she's here to tell us about all the wonderful things that they have going on in some of their current research projects. So with that, Jess, thank you so much for coming and we're very excited to have you here. Uh, thanks for having me. All right, and live stream folks, can you hear me? Yes, maybe so, hopefully. All right. <laughs> All right, well, I'll get started. Uh, like David said, I work for Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. I've been there for about six years now, and I am on the fish team, and I'll get into some more details about that later. But I'm gonna give you tonight kind of a broad overview of, the lot of a lot of the programs we do. So it might not be super detailed about any one project. So if you do have a question, my email is at the very end. You can you know take note of that, take a picture, or just you know, ask somebody at Reef to get a hold of me if you have any questions later. We will have a Q&A session after this, um, but otherwise I'll just kind of get started. I wanted to start with giving you a little bit of breakdown of FWC. 
at least for most of you who are locals, you're probably aware of FWC, at least a little bit. But I'm willing to guess what you're familiar with are these folks in law enforcement, right? Whether you see them out on the water, maybe run into them on a bridge if you're fishing, they are the boots in the ground enforcing our regulations. What you might not know is that there are a whole lot of other people that work more behind the scenes. So whether that's a scientist like myself, somebody who works more in management, but there are different divisions. So there is marine fisheries management. There's also freshwater fisheries management, as well as habitat, species conservation, hunting and game, because FWC does regulate you know, the state's resources. So this is the terrestrial animals we're talking about. This is the birds and the alligators. And when we get into the marine realm, uh, most of you probably know just the variety of different species we have. So to try to get as much data as possible and to try to have the science to manage as best we can, there are a lot of people doing a lot of different things. And where I work is right down here with the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. So this is primarily where all of us uh, geeky scientists are stuck down in here. And as you can probably guess with the rest of the blank area on the slide, there's even more breakdown within what we call FWRI. There are a lot of acronyms. I'm gonna try my best not to use too many of them. It's also difficult uh, as a scientist, we tend to use them a lot. One acronym, I'm just gonna warn you now, I'm gonna to refer to it always as FWC because saying Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission every time is a mouthful. <laughs> but within the Research Institute, we have these other groups. So we have everything from people who work more with social science. So that's trying to, all right, bring the human dynamic more into how we're managing our resources. But we have ecosystem assessment, restoration, Again, freshwater fisheries, can't forget about them. And again, down here, this is where I work with marine fisheries. And you guessed it, one more time. <laughs> there's also a breakdown in here. So there's a whole realm of science that happens within marine fisheries research. So there's folks who work with fisheries dependent monitoring. You can kind of get the name fisheries dependent means they are collecting their data from the fishery themselves. This means going to the dock or the ramp and the fish that are getting brought back by the recreational or commercial fishermen. It's the number of fish, the size of fish, the weight of the fish. That's the information they generate. But there's also fisheries independent monitoring, again, by the name, data independent of the fishery. So this is more like if you do a fish count, this is data collected separately from the fish that are getting brought back to the dock, separate from the fish that are getting harvested. So this also provides information for like small fish that are too small to be harvested, but we still need to collect that data. And in some cases, it's providing information on species we don't currently manage, but maybe we need to in the future. And again, all the way at the bottom, Keys Fisheries Research. That's a group that I work with. It's a little bit more specialized because we are down here. We are a little bit fairly remote. So we uh, are a little bit more autonomous ourselves than most other field labs. But FWC as a whole agency has over 3,000 employees and over 30 different offices and field labs throughout the state. So where you might only see a few of these law enforcement uh, officers, there's actually quite a number of people out here to try to best protect our resource, but balance that with the needs of the people. And I'll just mention, I don't have it on the slide because I kind of ran out of space, but within Keys Fisheries Research, there's even different groups. I work with the fin fish group, but there are people that work on the lobster fishery. There are people who work with stone crab or coral or restoration ecology and conch. So there's, again, a lot of diversity in what happens even at our smaller field lab. So for the rest of this talk, I'm just gonna focus on the research that my team does, the fin fish team. And you'll probably, hopefully, hear it a bunch tonight. What we do is not just what I do or not just what a coworker does. We do all of this as a group, and that's the only way it gets done. We also have a lot of collaborations and different partnerships. So well, I might be the one presenting this information. There is a whole team behind me accomplishing this. So to give you kind of a, a broad overview, we focus on applied questions in fisheries management and conservation involving both field work and analytical skills. So 
there's kind of three main themes. You've got the fisheries independent monitoring, which I kind of mentioned what that entails, which is really getting at how abundance in certain fish populations is changing over time. But we also focus a lot on fish reef behavior and movement ecology. So this is things like the spawning aggregations or individual movements from different fish. And fisheries for research is a little bit of a catch-all. So it's where there are data needs or maybe management questions, and we need to collect data to fill those data gaps or those questions. So the first bit I want to talk about with the fisheries independent monitoring are our reef fish visual census. Sorry, one more acronym, RVCs. So this is going to be similar to fish counts you do at reef. This is a standardized protocol that a lot of different agencies use. Uh, in our case, it's a point count. So you are you know, stationed at one point and you're basically doing a cylinder count a certain direction away from you, everything from the sea floor to the sea surface, every fish species you see, and you're also recording sizes, a min, max, and a mode. And you also have a dive buddy who's doing the same thing not too far away from you. And the purpose of this really is to, again, try to track those changes with doing some of this for really long-term monitoring projects. You get a good idea, all right, if you saw a change this year versus last, is that part of the natural fluctuation or is this a signal of more of a long-term trend? Well, if you have data like the reef visual census, really what it is now, we've been doing some version of these fish counts since 1999, but uh, really more standardized, you all came together to do it the same way for all these agencies coming together in 2008. So that's a pretty long-term data set where you can look at a certain species, you have enough information for them to see whether that trend is something real, maybe it's a management concern, or no, it's just natural variation, nothing to be worried about, or maybe in the middle, kind of keep your eye on it. And this data is also used in stock assessments. So if you're not familiar, stock assessments is another tool managers use to try to look uh, at more of a specific species, use that fisheries dependent data, so that catch coming in and look at those numbers. How are they doing over time? You can bring in fisheries independent data, kind of combine the two and get an idea of how that species is doing overall. Now, it's much more complex than that, but just know this is a way that data gets used. There's some very smart people doing a lot of uh, calculations to figure out how best to run the data and figure out, okay, this species is, is on track doing okay. If there are declines, then we need to have a bigger discussion. Now, a second part of our fisheries independent data is the SANE program. So this involves going to near shore seagrass beds and you take a SANE net. So ours is about 70 feet long and you pull it a set distance and you pull these two poles in together and it's basically forcing all the fish that were in the middle to go in this kind of pocket back here. So all of those fish, then we can take a look, record the species, the size, the numbers, and then return them. And this is a good way, again, to look at trends over time, because if you have a historical data set, it's a really good way to look at how those little juveniles are doing. Now you might think, what is a little juvenile, you know, is it really that imp much importance? But it is a good indication of how that stock is doing in terms of spawning, in terms of recruitment. If you have uh, a change, let's say, in regulation, and you increase the minimum size of a species a couple years later, maybe you see a lot more juveniles showing up in these SANE surveys. That's a good sign. That's, hey, maybe that management uh, regulation was good because we are already seeing effects in the juvenile, and you're going to see signs in this kind of data a lot faster than you're going to see in the adult type of sampling program like the fish counts. But the, the theme I think you guys are probably are going to find the most enjoyment out of is the reef fish behavior and movement. So this, again, like I said, involves things like spawning aggregation. So this video, I'll see if I can play it again, is Kubera snapper aggregating out in the dry tortugas. But we also can look at individual movement patterns using acoustic telemetry echo sounder buoys, and I'll touch on all of these topics next, but 
echo sounder buoys give an idea of biomass, kind of like your fish finder on your boat. But if we moor one up and leave it there, you can get an idea of how the fish masses are changing over time, you know, over season. And passive acoustic hydrophones are basically underwater microphones. So they're listening to all sounds. And you might know, you might not know, but certain fish make sound in particular relation to courtship and spawning. So if you know what sound that fish makes, you have these hydrophones out that are listening, you can go through the data and say, hey, we might not have seen spawning from this species, but we're seeing this signal in the data. These fish are making those calls. They, are, they only make those calls when there's spawning involved. This is pretty cool. And it's a way to have that kind of long-term uh, monitoring with some of this equipment without a lot of field effort. You can go put this equipment down, service it a couple times a year, and you have a year's worth of data, which is a lot easier to get than trying to get in the water every week, particularly if the visit is bad or the wind's really high and you can't get out. These are other ways to get at some of that data. So with the acoustic telemetry, this is a way to track an individual fish. There is an electronic tag and it's surgically implanted in a fish's abdominal cavity. And I will show you this video as an example. This is a dog snapper that we tagged out in the Tortugas. First thing you might notice is, hey, they're still underwater. We catch these fish underwater to, and tag them underwater to try to reduce barotrauma. So if you bring a fish up from depth, bring it to the boat, usually there's swim bladder expansion and you're trying to do a surgery and that fish is already stressed out. Maybe you have it in a, some sort of tank on the boat but it's still going to be a little stressed out. And if that swim bladder expands, you have to vent it so that fish can get back down to depth. That fish is also more susceptible to predation of a shark or let's say a bigger fish coming by. So we tag at depth to reduce all of those stressors. And the surgery takes maybe five minutes, but that tag went right in that abdominal cavity. So we're not going through any organs. We're not injuring them in that way. It's that superficial cut through their skin. You might have to remove a, through, uh, a few scales, particularly for something like a dog snapper. You suture them back up with dissolvable stitches. And we put an external dart tag uh, in their dorsal fin, which is just a bright orange tag to let people know, hey, there's something different about this, this fish. And that way, if it isn't an area where that fish is harvested, they could call a number, or maybe they can even find that tag that's in the abdominal cavity. So this is the same fish that we tagged, and you can see how strong it swam off. So we're not injuring that fish, and since we tagged it underwater, it is uh, much more suited to be able to find a place under a coral head to hide out, maybe recover before it goes on about its day. And we have actually done research comparing fish in the past we tagged on the boat, on the boat versus fish we tagged underwater, and there is a higher survival of fish we tag underwater. It's kind of hard to pull out the exact reasons because there are a lot of differences in the methods we, uh, of which one we do. But nevertheless, taking them underwater does increase their survival. And it's a pretty cool thing to do. So currently we have about 130 acoustic receivers, which I'll talk about in a minute, and 91 active tags. So these little tags that we put in the fish only have a set battery life. And it depends on how big that tag is or how often you set it to ping. So basically when you put that tag in a fish, that fish swims off and you have to have these acoustic receivers, which are listening for those tags. So it's like if this computer was one of those acoustic receivers, I'm close enough it detects me. It's like, hey, Jess was here on Tuesday night, 7, 15 PM. And that's recorded. So if I leave, come back, it's going to record it again. And the same thing's happening for our receivers. So we have about 130 keys wide, mostly in the lower keys and out in the tortugas. So it doesn't matter what fish we tag. If it swims by any of our receivers, it will pick it up and it will detect it. And there's also networks of scientists who use this method that we will share data. So if we get a bunch of detections on our receivers, it's not our fish. We don't know whose it is we share that data and somebody's like, hey, that's a hammerhead shark I tagged in Miami. And we're like, cool. Well, it was out here, you know, at this time. So that also helps the fellow scientists where we're all sharing data. 
And based on this uh, table, you can see primarily we're interested in groupers and snappers. And that's, of course, because we always come back to management. We are FWC. Some people might be really interested, but we're not going to tag a yellow goatfish, even though some people might find them pretty cool. It doesn't have management implications. So we're sticking with recreationally and commercially important species. So what can you do with that kind of data? We have uh, used this data in the past to demonstrate how the research, research natural area out in the dry tortugas, the RNA, uh, has benefited from just as its existence as a no-take reserve. And this type of data has also been used for the establishment of the seasonal spatial closure off Key West. It's a new closure as of last year. And again, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But some of this data can be used to look at where fish are hanging out and when they're hanging out there. And then you bring in other data, like a habitat map. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but here the red is basically hard bottom, coral, uh, this kind of darker sand color. There's some sort of pavement, but really not much coral, not much going on. And this lightest color is just sand. So this gives you an idea of where the fish are spending most of their time. And just uh, as a, another snippet of information, each of these dots is where a receiver is. It doesn't mean that fish is right there. So these things have a range of how far that they can hear, kind of like your Wi-Fi. You can go a certain distance and still get that uh, signal. If you go too far, you no longer get the connection. It's a similar thing with these receivers and the tags and the fish. And it depends on things like how complex a habitat is, or even how warm is the water. That all affects how sound is traveling through the water, which really is what this is. That tag is sending out a very specific code at a very specific frequency that those receivers are listening for. But this is an example of some grouper movement, and you can see this biggest dot is where those grouper were spending most of the time. But all of these lines, are where a fish had moved from one station to another. I'm not going to go too in-depth on this, but echo sounder buoys, I mentioned them before. This is a way to try to get at biomass over time. So you might not necessarily be able to tell what fish it is that's uh, in big numbers, in this case, below the buoy. If you're on a boat, it would be, what are all those fish marks under your boat? But we have more of them uh, kind of as a pilot project, again, out in the dry tortugas, to get to an area that we don't get to very often, maybe about once a year. So it's hard to document exactly what's going on. So we try to use this equipment. We tag fish. Anytime we're diving, we're taking video. But what's going on, you know, the 51 weeks out of the year, we're not there. So we moor these, and it gives us information on the fish, which we want you to focus on these figures, is the top. So this line for both of these images is, is basically the seafloor. So it's a part of processing the data. Initially, you're going to have basically two bottoms of just that sound kind of bouncing back. But up here are our, uh, the fish numbers, the fish masses. And you have to clean up the data a little bit. But after you do that, you can see, OK, this month, seems to be a hot spot. You get a lot of fish that are hanging up pretty high. Or if you have a mass of fish that are hanging out closer to the bottom, well, maybe those are your groupers. And you have more pelagics that are hanging up higher in the water column. Those are, again, all sorts of data you can get from some of this equipment. I'm not going to go in depth. And kind of the last part of this section Again, talking about the hydrophone. So this is what a hydrophone looks like in the water. This end up here is actually that underwater microphone. And this uh, bigger housing is more where the brains are, where the battery is. So we do have current partnerships with other scientists at NOAA to document the presence of grouper. And again, that's based on the sound they make for spawning and courtship. But you can also use this data to detect boat activity. So this is a way we're going to use it to monitor that new seasonal spatial closure, look at boating patterns when the closure is in place, when the closure is not in place. 
And something else maybe more relevant to you guys, we have used these hydrophones to detect that lionfish make sound. And although they do make a sound when agitated, the sound we were focusing on was a courtship call. So this was first brought to our attention by some partners at the University of Puerto Rico, and they had a hydrophone paired with the camera focusing on grouper. So they were trying to get, as grouper come by, do they make sound? What sound are they making? Well, they ended up getting two lionfish that came very close to that hydrophone. And as they came closer, they got closer to the camera. The sound got louder. Hey, lionfish make sound. And we think it's a courtship related call because we've only heard it when there are two lionfish together. When there's just a single lionfish, we don't hear it. It is a very soft call. You have to have that hydrophone, I would say within six feet of the lionfish. And again, there's no guarantee you're gonna catch it, but uh, with doing some work off of Marathon, we're able to, to capture the same sound that they heard in Puerto Rico, which was pretty cool. So I, it's not something I can play here, but it's a soft, we call it the purr of lionfish because it's almost like a cat purr type of thing. All right, and the last little theme is research for fisheries. So I mentioned that's kind of getting at the data gaps or getting the life history data, which is really how long does a species live? How big does it get? That sort of information. And Florida is a pretty good place for some species like parrotfish that we don't actively harvest here, but other places of the Caribbean, they don't have that information because they harvest those fish. So maybe they don't know exactly how old some of those fish can get, how big they get. So if we do some of that work, it's the same species, pretty similar conditions. It's information that they can use as well. And this last little part of the research for fisheries is Western dry rocks. And this is where the rest of this talk is gonna go. So I've mentioned there's a new seasonal spatial closure off Key West, and this is a new big project for our fish team. So the closure went into place April of last year, but kind of this year going forward, we're, we're kind of kicking up into a higher gear and doing a lot more research. So some of what I show you, I'll have some preliminary data from last year. Others are new bits, so I won't really have anything to show you as far as results. So Western dry rocks, there's a long history. If you've been around, you might know it, but it, it tends to be more of off Key West is where this history comes into place. But it's been a known spawning aggregation location for multiple species for multiple years. So it's been a point, kind of a contention, because it is a really good fishing, but it's also a place that has the spawning aggregation, so it's a good place to protect as well. So you guys probably don't need to know this, but spawning aggregations are times where many species of fish are coming together at predictable times and locations for the sole purpose of spawning. So some of them make those particular sounds we can listen to. Some of them are changing their color if you're in the water and you see that. But the concern is that predictability that fishermen can know when they're going to aggregate the time of year, the location, X amount of days after the full moon, which makes them vulnerable to overfishing. And over 60% of studied aggregations worldwide are either in decline or are gone. So these are really good spots if we know about to try to protect, even it's just for the time that they're spawning so that they're able to reproduce, able to make eggs and have those future generations of fish. So this picture is actually from Key West in the Western Dry Rocks area. There's about 40 boats and 0 0.05 square kilometers. So in miles, <laughs> There's your conversion. Needless to say, it's a very small area and there, all the boats are here because of these fish that are aggregating to spawn. In this case, it was for a mutton snapper. But it's not all doom and gloom, there is hope. Even if there is a small portion of that fish population that's still going to that place to spawn, that aggregation can recover. And kind of in our backyard, Riley's Hump out in the Dry Tortugas is a good example of this. So if you're not aware, here are the park boundaries. You have the Tortugas North Ecological Reserve 
and the Tortuga South Ecological Re Reserve, and they are no-take reserves that were put in place in 2001. The RNA here, which is a research natural area, was implemented in 2007. So the TSCR down here is also referred to as Riley's Hump. So throughout the rest of the presentation, you'll probably mostly see Riley's Hump, but you might also see TSCR. It's referring to the same place. So there was a mutton snapper aggregation at Riley's Hump that was overfished. And people were aware of it. They wanted to do something. So that's why that no-take reserve was put in place. And observations of mutton snapper slowly started to recover, starting as early as 2002, which was only a year after the closure. But it wasn't until 2009 that numbers were high enough that that aggregation really reformed more like what it used to be, and spawning was actually documented. And acoustic telemetry was also used in this study. Uh, this is a single mutton snapper, and you could see up here in the RNA is where it spends most of its time, most of the year. And before the full moon in May, June, and July, this fish made a trip down here to Riley's Hump and for the purpose of spawning. And then it went back to its same location right after uh, that spawning trip. And the same fish made this trip multiple years in a row. So this is showing that it's not just some random fish, sometimes are aggregating here, sometimes elsewhere. This same fish made that movement three times in one year and multiple years in a row. So that's showing that this area is really important for spawning, but also that it's kind of home site where it usually lives now in the RNA is also protected, which is great because kind of both parts of its life, obviously that fish can move outside and it's open to harvest then. But if you protect that spawning aggregation, and in this case, happen to have that fish live the other part of its life that's also in a reserve, that definitely is going to help your spawning aggregations recover help those populations recover. But it's not just recovery for this area or right here. It has implications for a much wider area. So this is a map showing locations of where all the RVC fish counts were conducted in 2000. So all the white dots are where there was no mutton snapper found. And the larger the dot and the closer to the color purple it's getting means there were more fish seen there, specifically mutton snapper. And you can see from 2000 to 2008, there was an increase in mutton snapper, basically in all areas of the Tortugas. And in 2016, again, even bigger increase with um, an increase out here, which is open to fishing or at least limited takes. Outside of any boundaries, there weren't as many surveys but there were also some fish here as well. But you can just see numbers that had not been seen since basically the start of uh, the monitoring. Let's see if this one will play. All right, this one might not play, but this was gonna show you a larval transport model to demonstrate if those fish were spawned at Riley's Hump about the full moon in July of 2008, that the larvae actually goes from that location at Riley's Hump throughout the Gulf of Mexico up here, as well as getting caught in that Gulf Stream and going up the east coast of Florida. So that means protecting that one location doesn't just protect that one location or at least improve the mutton snapper populations there. It has implications for all the tortugas. It has implications for all of the keys, even farther up the east coast of Florida and the west coast of Florida, because those larvae can travel so far. So this leads me back to western dry rocks. So early last year, FWC, and more specifically the commissioners, if you're familiar with the way FWC works, there are seven commissioners that ultimately vote on some of these decisions. And they voted to create a four-month seasonal closure, so April 1st through July 31st, 
this area is going to be closed to all fishing. And it was specifically to protect fish spawning aggregations. So if you're not familiar with Western Dry Rocks, it is approximately 10 miles to the southwest. Specifically, it's protecting mutton snapper, gray snapper, yellowtail snapper, and permit. However, there are a lot of other species that spawn there, or at least they're aggregating together. But going back to the management-related uh, focus of all of this, it's not quite as important, but you do see very high numbers, like I mentioned, the yellow goatfish, <laughs> or some of the other uh, fish that you might see while diving. Definitely elevated numbers compared to what you're going to see elsewhere, or at least elsewhere in the Keys. Some of them, we're not sure if they're actually spawning, but they are elevated numbers compared to other places. So to do work here, we basically broke it down to three main objectives. One is pretty self-explanatory, documenting changes in the behavior, abundance, and size structure of these fish aggregations over time. So if we put this closure into place, how is that affecting those fish themselves? Hopefully, we're able to protect them. They're able to reproduce. We're going to see more fish, bigger fish. Um, maybe they change in where they hang out. And how we get to that, which we've already talked about a little bit, are the diver fish counts and acoustic telemetry. So this is some preliminary data from last year. Similar to the other map, the bigger the circle, the more fish. And this time, it's just color-coded by species. So if you see right here this big chunk, there are a lot of gray snapper, permit, and yellowtail snapper compared to mutton snapper, which we only saw in smaller numbers throughout the whole area. So this is an example of what that permit aggregation looks like. So we estimated that in this school, those permit were about 23 to 28 inches fork length and about 150 to 200. So when we're in the water, we are trying to document some of this, the size and the numbers. As you know, sometimes it's a little bit hard to get, particularly in the case of permit. Sometimes they'll come in, only hang out for a few seconds, move somewhere else, move pretty quick. It's hard to really get an accurate count, but that's where videos come in. Then we can take a look at those later. You can you know, pause it, try to get a better count. Sizes, though, generally does happen in the water. If you do have a camera that might have two lasers and those are set a set distance apart, say 10 centimeters, when it hits another fish, you know the distance between those two dots is 10 centimeters, regardless of how far out that fish is. That's something, you know, a little bit more advanced or something we might work on for a different side of it. But when we're in the water, it's more we're trained well enough and practice well enough that we're going to get at least approximate. It's not going to be perfect. And this is an example of this uh, gray snapper aggregation. So these are smaller gray snapper, 7 to 13 inches fork length, but we estimated between 1,200 and 1,600. So it just goes to show you that there are these places that are pretty special. You're not going to see this just anywhere. And maybe you don't see evidence of spawning, so you try to do some other work. Snapper are not one that makes sound when they're spawning, but if we go there often enough, it's pretty hard to say, hey, they're in these high of numbers. It has to be that they're aggregating to spawn. And switching over to the telemetry, all of these triangles are where we have one of those acoustic receivers that listens for tags. So not as important, the red triangles were just ones that we added this past year. We're trying to kind of fill in the box. So there's more of a grid and you catch that fish regardless of which direction it's moving. So we did tag 33 snappers this year. So that's a combination of mutton snapper, gray snapper, and dog snapper. And we're gonna continue this year with a bigger focus on mutton snapper. But we are tagging both outside and inside that closure to see where those fish move. Do they have the same type of movement patterns? Do the ones that are hanging out in the closure stay here? Are the ones that are tagged outside move into the closure certain times a year? These are all questions we're hoping to answer with this sort of data. And to give you an example of what you can do with that data in a little bit different of a way, more interactive than that other graph I showed you, this is a movement of a single gray snapper over two and a half hours. 
So these smaller white dots are our acoustic receivers. The larger white markers are the boundaries of that um, closure. So you can see that fish is moving back, back and forth. And although that fish is hanging out right where that dot is, again, it's not necessarily right at that specific location, but within a range, let's say within 200 meters of that dot is where the fish is, so somewhere in here. So this is a, a really quick way to look at that movement, look for any patterns. You can start to combine it with other um, independent fish tracks to see, hey, are they doing the same thing? Is one species avoiding the other? There's kind of an endless amount of questions that you can answer when you have a lot of data like this. And to supplement this, we have current meters, which are recording the direction and speed of water current. So this will tie into, hey, these fish are aggregating these times of the month. Is this related only to lunar cycle? Is this related to lunar cycle and, and water temperature? Is it also tied into the direction that the currents are coming from? So on this lower graph, the blue is the speed of the current, the green is the direction, the red is the temperature. And I can tell you when we were there at the end of June, which it doesn't look super high, but it was very high current. <laughs> the type where you get to the bottom and you either need to abort or you're pulling yourself up to where you need to go. So it does uh, vary a lot down there. So objective two, this is an area that I'm not gonna have anything to show you because it's a new one. But when we're talking about spotting aggregations, if we really wanna get at how well is this closure affecting those fish populations, we're gonna take samples specifically looking at gonads. Or if you think about it, how many eggs does this female fish have? If the fish are a little bit bigger, what does that mean in terms of the egg production? If that fish is older, what does that mean in terms of egg production? So we're gonna take all these samples, and again, this is over the, the time of the closure. So right now, it is a seven-year sunset clause. So at the end of seven years, the commissioners can come back look at the science and say, okay, this is working, we're gonna keep it, or it's not working, or maybe in the middle, and we need to make some modifications. And the last objective is bringing that human dimension back in. So how does Western Dry Rock's seasonal closure affect stakeholders? And this is not just talking about fishermen, but that's one of the stakeholders and it's talking about recreational fishers, charter boat captains, commercial guys. This is talking about you as divers, ecotourism businesses in the area. Basically anybody who is actively using the waters around Key West, how does that affect them? And particularly, how does that affect them money-wise? So there's going to be socioeconomic surveys, which is really trying to get after how that um, closure is affecting people in the pocketbook. And like I mentioned before, we can look at changes in boating pattern. So if people are not fishing at Western Dry Rocks, where are they going? And for the changes in boating pattern, I mentioned hydrophones, but we can also use aerial surveys, which has been used in the past and has been used in the past at Western Dry Rocks. You go up in a small plane and you can basically record you know, your lat long, how many boats are there? What did it look like they were doing? All right, there's a lot of dive boats or there's a lot of fishing boats, how many? And then you can kind of track that to the time of year, the, the time of day, what the fish were doing, what your other data says. And one neat thing with those hydrophones, I mentioned it can track boating pattern, but you can get at what the boat was actually doing. Was it moving slow? Was it maneuvering? In which case you're talking about a seasonal closure if you can hear these boats that are moving pretty slow, they're actively using the area, whether they're diving or fishing, maybe about to set up an anchor, as opposed to a boat that's moving very fast, has a different signal, you know that boat was just moving through the area, which is fine. You can transit through, you just can't harvest fish there. So this will also get at compliance. So if you have a lot of activity there and that slow maneuvering, there's either a lack of educating people about this closure, or maybe there's a lack of compliance, which can feed into a lack of enforcement. 
Of course, when we're doing our work out there, we're going to be on a boat making a bunch of slow maneuvering noises. So that's something we'll have to separate out when we're there. But it's still a, a way to get at some of that data with that limited time on the water or in a plane. Again, that hydrophone is always recording data. And this is another area that we are having partnerships because some of this data is new to us and it's pretty advanced ways to analyze this. So if you just give us some data, we're gonna look at it and be like, well, that looks cool, but what else do I do with it? We have to reach out with partnerships who really have that expertise so they can teach us really the steps that we need to take to have this data in a usable format. So that way in seven years, we can go to the commission and be like, this is all we found. We did the best science we can. We're not making the decisions, but we're trying to give the best possible science so other people can make those decisions. So with that, I'm gonna end on my thank you slide to show you one that although we do a lot of work, we also have a lot of fun while we do it. And also that, again, we do this in partnerships and collaboration, and it's never a one-man team, that there are a whole bunch of people that go into making this all happen. If you have questions, my email's up there. Otherwise, thank you for coming out, and hopefully it was a good first fish and friends back after a couple of years. So thank you. All right, yes. Uh, we had a question asking about how visibility affects the fish count. Uh, so that is a good question, although I will say we are doing the fish counts on uh, scuba. We're not doing them free diving, but visibility always affects it. Basically, if it's less than five meters, so 15 feet, we abort it because you can't see the fish that aren't there. You're going to have a biased count. <laughs> uh, obviously, some days here in the Keys, you have really good viz. In Key West, it's never as good a viz it is, as it is up here in Key Largo. So it's sometimes hit or miss. Also, it depends on your depth. Sometimes we'll just wait for the tide to shift and then go back to that same spot and we're able to do a count. So it's that line of we don't want to skip too many, but we also don't want to take data that's not going to be useful. Because later on, when we collect this data, if there were counts that were taken and the visibility was three feet, we're not going to include that anyway. We can't compare that to a count where you could see your whole cylinder compared to a count you saw a fraction of it. So if it's too bad, we do skip it and we use five meters or 15 feet as a cutoff because our point counts, uh, it's, it's basically a big cylinder and it's 15 meters across, uh, seven and a half meters for that radius. So if it's six meters, you can still get that whole cylinder. Maybe you have to move a little bit one direction from the middle, a little bit over here, but you can see all parts of your cylinder without too much movement. If that visibility is four meters, you really have to move around so much and you're gonna miss a lot of what's going on in the other part of your cylinder. And it also becomes a safety thing. If you're too far away from your buddy, you can't see what they're, what, you know, you know if they have a problem, it's another reason why we'll abort it if the visibility is too low. Second question is hydrophones. How do you download the data and how often? So it depends on how you set them up. You can set them to record continuously, which is a lot of data. For us, we have a separate server. We actually call it the big data server, and it has 30 terabytes of data. So we'll just kind of offload everything. But for the most case, it's just SD cards, micro SD cards, a higher, um, you know, memory level for them and you just put it in a computer and transfer files and later you have to bring in a different program that can actually read that data and to make the graphs uh, like I showed you. Yeah. For those particular units, how often do you retrieve them? All right, so I'll repeat the question this time. <laughs> it's asking about uh, hydrophones and how often they're retrieved. This again comes back to how you program them. So if they are recording continuously, we have to go out about every three to four months to turn them around because we don't want data gaps. If you have them on what we call a duty cycle, saying it's recording five minutes every 10 minutes. So it's recording for 10 minutes or recording for five minutes, sleeping for five minutes, coming back on. 
you know, you can double that, maybe six months. If you have it on even shorter duty cycle, you know, a minute every 10 or 15 minutes, maybe you only have to get out, you know, once a year, you can hit like kind of the nine month mark. It just depends. Would you rather have continuous data and have a chance that it dies before you go back to it? Or maybe intentionally miss some data along the way, but not have big data gaps? Yes. So I'm sure it depends per species how close the fish have to be to the hiding pond for it to pick it up. But for mm -hmm. the species that FMEC monitors, what's kind of like the general distance it has to be away? All right. This question was asking about how far from the hydrophone a fish has to be to actually detect the sound. And yes, it does depend on species. Some of them make a much louder sound. Some of them are much quieter. And that also can depend on how noisy your habitat is in general. If you have an area where there's a lot of snapping shrimp, there's a lot of other fish, that signal might be lost a little bit sooner than if you're at a site that was really quiet. As you could imagine, if you have a healthy reef site, it's probably going to be a little bit noisier compared to a unhealthy or degraded spot. Or if there's just, you know, pavement, no coral, not a lot going on, it's probably going to be quieter. You can hear farther away. In terms of specifics, I don't know that I have a great answer for you because this is still new to us. Uh, but in some cases, I think it could be 500 meters for a certain group or species. And like I said, for lionfish, we had to be within six feet. Blue whales, you can hear, you know, or whales in general, you can hear for, you know, miles. So it really just depends on what your species is and, uh, again, the conditions. Yes. So during the seasonal closure, do you guys mark Western dry rocks differently? That's a great question because in theory, yes, it has not happened yet. So last year, actually, things happened pretty quick which you could imagine from like an agency and state agency level, you might be a little surprised, but it happened so quick that actually there were never marker buoys to market. And part of the problem is, especially on the south side, if I can go back, it's pretty deep. So there was an issue with contracting out somebody to establish uh, mooring buoys here. So we had talked to the sanctuary because they already maintain all of those mooring buoys that you're going to see at the spas, but they usually use sand screws. And these depths here are about 150. So then if you're talking about contracting out, increased rates or hazard pay, and discussion about what else they can do in terms of the hardware on the bottom. And that's in the works right now. Not sure if it's going to be in place by April 1st of this year, but hopefully not too much later afterward. But yes, there will be some sort of permanent tackle down below to a subsurface float, I don't know, maybe 20 feet or so from the surface, and then a point of detachment. So you can go and put the buoys during the closed season, and at the end of the closed season, somebody just goes and you know unshackles them, takes those big surface marker buoys away, but the tackle keeping everything at the bottom is still there. So you don't have to repeat that effort every year. It's just going out to put those big uh, marker balls back out. So you're just be putting like regular spa balls like you would have up here. Is that like the idea or? Yeah, I don't know exactly if it's going to be marked different than the normal yellow spa ball. I don't have that level of detail, but there's gonna be something similar to that to mark these. Uh, currently right now, of course it's on our website, but since we don't have marker buoys, law enforcement has basically just been giving warnings, letting people know, hey, if you don't know, this is a closed area. We know there aren't any markers. Um, so that's to the extent right now, hopefully when the markers are actually out and maybe charts updated, that information is in everybody's GPS. They know about it. Or if you use an app, it's in there. So you're aware of it. Um, yeah. Was there a second part of that question or no? Okay. Yes. So as divers, uh, I know these areas are closed for fishing, but like... Uh, it's, it's open to diving. Uh, sorry, the question was for, for divers, how does this affect them? Is it also closed for diving? It does not. It's a no take, which means you can't harvest anything. You can't collect the fish, but you can certainly dive. In the past, there hasn't been a ton of diving activity in here. You do have, you know, the Vandenberg, which is farther to the east, or there are some mooring balls up here, which is some of the shallower water to the north of that closure. 
Sometimes people will moor up there and dive. So yeah, there might be more activity or opportunity for people to move in here now that there won't be a ton of fishing boats. Um, so that's certainly a possibility. I also want to mention, because I didn't specifically state it before, but if you look at this scale bar, this closure is actually very small. That's only one square mile. So you can certainly still fish outside of this closure, you know, or even right on the other side of the line. But right here in the center, actually, it's covering Boca Grande Bar. And it's more locally referred to as Western Dry Rocks, even though actual Western Dry Rocks is this area up to the north that's shallower, which is what that name implies with dry rocks. And that's where those mooring buoys are currently. But the closure is actually just to the south here, a mile and a half long, about a half mile tall. Yes? Um, when you were tracking the currents, you had those out when the fish were spawning as well too. Were you seeing that the currents were changing while they were spawning? Or were you seeing that they were kind of staying consistent? Because I know for like the Grouper Moon Project, for the Nassau Groupers, when they spawn, the currents are shifting to bring the water bay back to Little Canyon instead of going out to the ocean. So are you seeing the same thing with these fish here? So the question is asking about currents and if we had seen a change in current in relationship to spawning. So we haven't looked fully into this data yet. And part of it is we actually did not see mutton snapper spawning this year. And that's kind of a, a whole other like side topic, but they, you know, if they do move around a little bit, we just weren't in the right spot. Uh, and we did get kind of kicked out from diving and some of our other ops a couple of the months just because of not good conditions. So maybe we just missed it, but that is a, a future step in what we want to go for. We just haven't got there yet to analyze it. Well, Jess, thank you so much. Yeah. All right, Jess, thank you so much for speaking. We really appreciate it. We have our small token of appreciation for you with our. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate you sharing uh, what Fish One Life is up to. Yeah. Uh, and thank you all so much for coming. It's great to be back together here at Reef, back together at Fish and Friends. We'll see you uh, next month and through August for uh, Fish and Friends, uh, second Tuesday of every month still consistently. Uh, we'll see you here. Okay, Thank great. you so much. Really appreciate it.